right, let's get this show on the road. So greetings, technical art community. Now, have you ever been frustrated by the industry? You know, feeling like you've lost all of your creative freedom? You know, the game, the film, and the simulation industries are extraordinarily demanding, where artists ha are expected to produce a copious amount of content conforming to someone else's vision and with no viable opportunity for creative opportunity. You know, does that sound familiar? Uh, this is the way that I used to think before meeting Douglas Leong back in uh, 2012 at SIGGRAPH Asia at Singapore. Yeah, that was, uh, I know it was eight years ago, it seems like it was only yesterday, but needless to say, uh, today's presentation is going to be my interview with Douglas Leong. So, although uh, at SIGGRAPH, we were both there to demonstrate Houdini software, when Douglas presented his material, everyone, you know, I mean everyone, the whole SIGGRAPH just stopped, including myself, and we just had to stop and take notice because the work that Douglas was doing with Lighthouse Media International was just simply mind-blowing. Okay, okay, by now you probably have a sense of who I am and what I stand for. And of course I'm teaching tech art fundamentals, but I'm also teaching those technical art secrets that will transform your grueling job into a, a rewarding career, and it will empower you to have the fearless strength, or what I call the asbestos underwear, to fulfill your full artistic potential. So, stick around today for my interview with Douglas Leong, subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on LinkedIn and in Facebook, join the tech art groups in both LinkedIn and Facebook, and get some valuable information by today's interview to unleash your inner tech art beast. And with all things going, let's get this interview started. Greetings everyone out there in tech art land. I'm here today with Douglas Leon. We are uh, spent over the, uh, the magic of Zoom and the magic of the internet. Uh, Douglas is in Singapore. Well, I am in Orlando, Florida, and we are 12 hours apart, but still connected uh, via the internet. So how are you doing today, Douglas? Oh, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. I, I'm, it's really an honor to be uh, here with you on this channel. I've uh, watched a lot of good content, and uh, for instance, the Nigara topic that you talk about today is gonna be really helpful for the community. It's a pleasure to be with you. There's a lot to learn with about the Niagara and the Houdini yeah. integration, uh, yeah. uh, but we got to start someplace and bit, yes, little baby so steps. I uh, got to eat that yes. elephant one little small step at a time, right? Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's always always your, your zeal. Uh, we've met like seven over years ago. You, you're still learning, producing and, and pushing forward. Really yeah. good job, Chris. Yeah. Uh, for, for everyone that uh, is wondering, Douglas and I met about eight years ago at SIGGRAPH Asia in 2012 in uh, Singapore. And uh, we were both uh, demonstrating Houdini software at the time. And uh, when it was our turns to present, um, when Douglas presented, everyone just stopped and they couldn't believe their eyes when uh, Douglas was presenting his material. It seemed uh, he was presenting an overwhelming and kind of like unimaginable amount of material that he and his team at um, at uh, let me see if I'm getting this uh, right. Oh, but this at, is at Lighthouse, Lighthouse, yeah. Just I just say Lighthouse. Lighthouse easier easier to, to Lighthouse remember. Media International. Yeah, yes, yeah, right. Yes, uh, Douglas and his team at Lighthouse Media International were able to produce such phenomenal and. Uh, world building results in, with just such a small team and for such large studio quality. And so needless to say, uh, we're in for a very strong treat today. So Douglas, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, thanks, Chris. I, I, I'm really excited to share uh, what some uh, knowledge and some uh, production uh, strategies that I have. I hope you will help uh, many people, including the young Houdini artists that's getting into the game. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to strive for is give uh, the young Houdini artists and the young technical artists a, a place to start and some of the experienced technical artists may be possible of a alternative way of thinking or a alternative way of approaching uh, production demands in order to become more uh, efficient and able to leverage their skills and the skills of their artists to uh, the nth degree. Wonderful. So, the big let's get on with the big question that I have here. 
and um, and so the question is, you know, this is big. So, but suppose, you know, just imagine that you're an artist. You're just starting off in the CGI job, uh, and you have uh, you've just started off in your career as a digital artist, and you've gone through the basic tutorials of Maya or maybe Blender. Uh, for that matter, and then you've just been hired, you know, congratulations, uh, by a real-time experience company. And you go, real-time experience company, that's something brand new. What, what, what does that mean? But anyway, they hired you to create uh, their, their, their current asset pipeline, and they want you to, you're, you're being hired to speed it up, because they just landed a huge contract about the World of Warcraft size, and they heard that proceduralism you know, what is a way to help their, um, to help their pipeline, their modeling, their animation speed up. They heard it would help them save their, uh, their behinds. So the question to you is, how would you go about learning proceduralism as fast as possible? And as a, uh, as a side note, they're not even gonna be using one of the uh, engines that we're used to, whether that be, um, uh, Unity or UE4, they're going to be using Touch Designer to display its experience. So for you, for with your years of experience, how would you suggest that this student learn proceduralism as fast as possible? Oh, that's a wonderful question uh, because um, questions in this uh, category, I have uh, artists visit me at my studio. I have uh, trained and mentored many uh, artists that's in the same zone. So the, the idea is because uh, how I would approach this question will not be so much on to point you to a particular tutorial or to let you visit a particular website because I, I, from the way I see it, you, you mentioned, uh, Chris, you mentioned that the artists have already went through things like Maya and Blender and things like that. They have some uh, very good uh, CG background. They have a foundation. But the thing is... Uh, using this foundation, how would it help them and so forth? So normally I have, I have this, uh, uh, this uh, kind, uh, kind of slides with me. I have some demo files. Yeah, I encounter this question so often. So I, I, I kind of like took my production experience and all that. And I kind of like uh, have this presentation to help uh, 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 young uh, artists and so forth that's getting into the game. The important thing is this. I would say that uh, learning like all things, it's a strategy. Because the problem is that we know by now, it's not during uh, Chris and I started that time, you know, like 20 years ago or so, where if you want to learn something like Houdini, there's only a manual and a videotape and so forth. There's nothing out there. But now you're having more content that you can consume. So today you require strategy, how to go about and how to identify where proceduralism is and look for the right training material to help you and gain experience. So, uh, Chris, can I share my screen? To, oh, to please, go right up? ahead. Okay. Yes, take, the, yeah. take controls, Douglas, please. Be my hey. guest. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah, okay. I will just share my screen and let's get the ball rolling. All right. Okay. This is, uh, this is uh, one of the... Uh, this still comes from one of the... Uh, experiment uh, r d that i was doing world creation okay the 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 a little bit of uh, background behind because my production team uh kind of when we went procedural it's uh as small as three to finally to a scale of eight but we have to create massive worlds like what chris asked world of warcraft scale and all it's huge so um how this is about i'm, I'm going to show you a series of slides that explain procedural strategy so that you can learn more effectively. All right, so uh, this is yeah, one of the stills that, uh, as you can see, complex stuff, uh, you, have, uh, you have lots of pillars uh, and you have uh, procedure anima animation and so forth. So, okay, this is uh, one of the uh, asset that I've created. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a kind of a pillar asset. It, it works with the entire pipeline. I call it one heaven pipeline because I'm going to create heaven with just very few people. So what you see here when it's happening live, what you see here is basically an asset that can generate multiple pillars. So for learning, understand that proceduralism is not modeling one item. You're going to use a logic, a network 
of a combination of dependency and so forth in your asset, in your network to generate lots and lots of data. So you talk about this thing uh, called a, a pillar that has fluids and so forth. So it's very tedious if, for instance, a director say, oh, uh, I would like to have, instead of 19 fluids, can I, everything is perfect, can I have 12? Then for, if you already put in all the motive, like at this moment, it will be a nightmare if you have used traditional techniques. So proceduralism solves problems like this. Motives, details can automatically adapt, procedurally adjust to whatever logic that you have given. So let's go to the next slide. This is a demonstration of, uh, it's, it's uh, not done by many hours. It's an output for this asset. When I was testing, I'm gonna give a talk the following week. I tested the asset for 15 minutes, one five. And I have, this is the end result. And I spent the next couple of minutes based on this structure. And I output another asset, another pillar, I mean, that, that is, you can use for production and so forth with a different look. But let's say I want to do something that's out of the world, something I've never seen before. Well, look at the next slide. So this is an example of proceduralism and how it's applied. That's why when uh, Chris is mentioning, proceduralism can accelerate a lot of processes. This pillar uh, asset is just one of them. Chris, if you want to ask me anything in the process, please go ahead. No, I think you're doing great, Doug. I, I love the content that you're giving, and it's uh, it's, it's 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 very interesting. Uh, so, how did you go about? And uh, now, which package did you use in order to uh, create this? Okay, I'm using a side effects Houdini to create this uh, asset. So this, uh, I think this is a uh, kind of a uh, done Houdini sixteen time. Uh, mm -hmm. Now it's Houdini 18, so it's, it's quite a couple of years back. I think it's around 2015, 2016 time that I developed this. The cool thing about uh, uh, Side Effects Houdini is because they, they from, from day one, uh, the idea of Houdini is they know that there's always one thing in our line, this thing called changes. It's going to be very tedious if your supervisor, the director or the client want to change one particular element and you have to uh, create the whole thing from scratch. So Houdini, what it does is it's a series of operators that you can make changes in any part of this model. For instance, you want to change uh, the flutes and all that. You just adjust that the whole re end result will cascade down and affect the final output. So side effects Houdini is what I'm using to create this. And this is called a Houdini digital asset. Gotcha. Now, when you uh, created this uh, particular asset, uh, could you, uh, uh, where was your final destination? Meaning that were you uh, using the offline renderer or were you going to be taking these objects and putting them inside of uh, another, uh, another alternative uh, real-time engine? Oh, for, for this, uh, this, I'm doing the, uh, the understanding of both Revelation movie. So essentially it's for uh, rendering. So it's okay, gotcha. actually for uh, a CG uh, short film, like cinematics, Bible cinematics kind of thing. So, but the same concept uh, will apply because I, I uh, for the past few years, I've trained students from a uh, real time uh, background. They came from big studios to um, small studios to people that want to do real time graphics. In fact, they're learning this particular skill from me, procedural modeling. The term is procedural modeling, how to, uh, create pillars and so forth. Gotcha. So it, yeah. it can be applied to a uh, real-time environment. It's okay. the same uh, backbone. It's, it's the mm -hmm. same setup. Now, have you had any experience with uh, Houdini Engine? Oh, yes. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so I think this is the, uh, the, the talk of the day because we're talking about like current uh, topics and so forth. So I guess uh, Houdini Engine is something that is uh, extremely uh, powerful that we have to kind of uh, cap capitalize. So Houdini engine, what the, 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 the thing that I'm interested in is actually real time. It's like uh, what Chris is sharing most of the time. So I have uh, done Houdini engine both for Unreal Engine and to connect to Unity as well, both. So this is uh, the area that I'm in. So the, the like, uh, this is an example of three. So the, the thing is, uh, my experience with Houdini engine is basically, uh, 
is, is I'm pleasantly surprised. Why? Because the asset that I've created when I load it in Houdini engine, whether it's Unity, whether it is Unreal Engine, the response is very fast. Uh, I can dial in parameters and all that, and my asset will adapt on the fly. I, I, I don't even feel that uh, I'm using another program to load Houdini Engine into the environment, the real-time environment. All right, fantastic. Uh, yeah, uh, I, this broadcast is going to be bringing out not only to real-time technical artists, but to also uh, offline rendering uh, technical artists. So oh, needless yeah. to say, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, once this next generation of uh, consoles come out or when uh, uh, Unreal Engine comes out with version five and NVIDIA rolls out, as a, there is going to be no more difference between offline and real time. Uh, I have a hunch that there's going to be a large swing in the industry towards everything's going to be real time. And so that's why yes. I, like to, I like to try to encourage uh, my students to try to consider everything as potentially as uh, a real time asset, even if they are uh, doing something offline such as this, because this is all part of the full real time pipeline in one form or another. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I, I, I also agree with you, Chris, uh, because I've been uh, looking at the market trends and so forth. Uh, I also saw the, the Unreal Engine 5 demo. I, I think this, this, it, the future will be really uh, real time rendering is huge. Yeah, the gap is getting closer and closer. Yeah, it's fantastic now. Now, could you explain what's going on here with uh, uh, what you're trying oh. to do with this uh, particular <laughs> asset? Okay, this asset is, is cute. Yeah, because you know, uh, the, the idea is right. Uh, my, my goal is because I have a lot of uh, interns and all that. They, 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 I, so I was thinking, hey, if I want to decorate heaven, I will, need, I will need to have a lot of motives. But I guess as an artist, how we, we often we like to draw one way or the other. But what if our 2D art can become a 3D model just like that? So I actually created this asset that you can actually absorb a 2D motive like this and you can have handles and so forth to nudge it to become a 3D model and a motif for the, my topic is heaven. So I, it, it, will, it will be highly decorated as what you can see. So uh, this is what happened, yeah. So as you can see, finally I got a leaf and all that so forth. So proceduralism is not only means you generate data from scratch, you can also input the data in a suitable form, then you can procedurally adjust it, nudge it and let it become a 3D form. This is the example that I'm showing. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, as I change 2D motif, the uh, your, your uh, 2D uh, uh, input uh, vector art, then it immediately become a 3D input. Yes, this is what I'm trying to do. So accelerate a lot. It's very fast to do those 2D art, and the uh, one artist can just churn out a lot uh, in a day. That's how we can accelerate production. Do you think this is a a tool that uh, a technical artist could set up ahead of time and then pass on to a traditional artist who doesn't really understand proceduralism? And do you think that this tool would be able to uh, empower the uh, artist, the other artist, to uh, leverage their skills to produce, uh, uh, you know, greater assets faster and then better quality? Um, definitely, because the. The thing is, uh, that's a good question because when, when I deal with uh, uh, my studio, I often have very young interns. Some, are, some of them, they, have, they come from uh, animation background. So they have not done any form of proceduralism, but I do hand them exacts like this because they are the artistic people, right? So they can draw the motif themselves. They can um, kind of like uh, uh, ask a colleague to create that 2D thing. Then they have their first experience uh, in generating procedural art using this asset. It accelerates a lot. Yeah. So the idea is how you can collaborate as a whole uh, to kind of take things further. Because in, in a production, there's a lot of people that can draw very well. But a lot of time is how can I make the most out of the art? So this is an example that can help a lot. Yeah. Now your tools are very, they seem to be very intuitive and they are uh, very helpful. What would you suggest to somebody as a, a novice technical artist or a technical director? What mental strategy should they employ when creating tools such as this? Okay. The, let's say this particular tool, the, 
idea behind is uh, always have a strategy of what you want to do. For instance, um, like I will just go back, backtrack the slides a little bit to explain to you. Okay, the strategy behind, right? Okay, this is the, uh, the, the, the mindset, the thinking. Let's say I want to do that two, two just now uh, to do a, a 2D to 3D. So first of all, you must think of the input. What kind of uh, input are you going to put in? So the thing is, this is the, the first part we establish. Okay, my goal is to create 3D motif, but from 2D background. So the, the clear idea is you must have uh, understanding of what goal that you have in mind. Secondly, for instance, the uh, the motif uh, asset. I'll just dial down. Okay, so let's say this this particular guy. The 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 strategy behind is okay. Number one, apart from all the uh, things that that can turn the mot uh, motif into that give volume, you are looking at a UI, right? You're looking at UI. How do you kind of like uh, have an interface to adjust every aspect? So some strategy that I use was. If I want to give it to an artist, these are ramps. If you look at this part that's sliding just now, it is actually RAM. So you don't have to be a, a, a very sophisticated programmer and all that to use a RAM. You don't need. So take note of things like that. If your users are not so technical, give them tools like that. And give them handles like that because this is very common even you use something as... Uh, uh, and, there's always handles and all that you see in Photoshop, you see it in, in even PowerPoint, there's always handles. So take strategies like this to help the user uh, kind of uh, feel at home and happy to dial in your asset. Then the other thing to take note is if I have all these handles, how do I connect all these numbers, all these parameters to drive the underlying tech, the set of nodes that's within Houdini? How to connect that uh, that user control to drive proceduralism. I think that is very, very critical. This kind of overall strategy. Yeah. So you were able to control and actually create this tool yourself. Uh, did you have to use a, a programmer or did you have to employ uh, uh, some kind of outside help? Because this, uh, this tool looks very sophisticated. Uh, no, I, I, I did it myself. Yeah, in fact, uh, I, 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 I kind of like... Uh, did most of the studio pipeline myself. And fundamentally, I do not have a uh, programmer, uh, programming background even, you know. I, I, I don't have a degree in computer science, that kind of stuff related. No, I'm actually an artist. My background is I'm a graphic designer by, by, by my, during that time, there's no such education. So I, I came from that background. So the thing is, uh, even I'm talking to youngsters now, uh, new, new, new artists that wanted to get into this, you, you want to do, do something so sophisticated, you do not need uh, all this because, right, Houdini is, a is based on uh, dependency data passing down one to another and you are playing with notes. So all these notes is already uh, well constructed. So you have to learn a very important thing which data flow and things like that. So uh, yeah, it is uh, not an easy task uh, because I, I, I kind of like... Uh, after some years of building up my skills, then uh, yeah, I can take on something like that. Initially, perhaps something like the 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 something like a pillar will be a uh, uh, more uh, uh, I'll be able to handle easily because this one con uh, kind of involves things like UI and things like that. But uh, yeah, I did it myself. I I didn't hire anybody. It's a solo job. Yeah. Okay. Now, and as it's tested by my users. Yeah. As an artist yourself, do you think that yeah. you have to surrender any kind of, uh, you know, if you're employing something like proceduralism, uh, are you uh, sacrificing any kind of creativity? Are you giving up on any kind of uh, creative control and freedom? Um, I, for me, I don't think so. I just based on, I'll go through a few uh, screenshots to explain to you. Mm -hmm. This uh, you see all the pillars, the towers are all generated procedurally. I would say I did not sacrifice any uh, artistic uh, element. In fact, proceduralism allowed me to do a lot of things that I can't. Like, for instance, this uh, whole city, the, the, the buildings are not manually modeled 
the, the city is not laid out manually, it's procedurally done. I can do such a big scale with just eight people simply because of proceduralism. It does not tie my hand in any manner. In fact, it makes the impossible possible. So now, look at this. Yes, yeah, sorry. Come again. No, I'm just saying like this is, a, uh, this is a phenomenal scene and there's a lot of detail here. How many, yes. pe how many artists uh, did it take once, you, once your tools were created? How many artists did this take to put together and, uh, how, and how long did you guys put, it take to, to create this particular scene? The city. Um, okay, the, the city, okay, I, I can't uh, really uh, give a hard number simply because when this is, this is like a, like a, a kind of a, like a, a, a release date and all that kind of thing. So it's like we have to jump from one scene to the other, right? So uh, timing wise, maybe I can't really advise in a more, uh, a very precise way, but I, was, I can tell you basically uh, on this scene, I have, I have one uh, lighting, I have one uh, asset artist, okay, to help me. Then I have a couple of interns, maybe two to work on this. And myself, I'm handling the master pipeline. So uh, essentially, yeah, things like that at once, at once over a period of time. Yeah, so the, the, the thing is, it's not, uh, 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 what you call that, it's, it's doable because what I did is at first, the first time it didn't turn out so well, but because it's procedural, I can keep upgrading it and all that uh, as the time fits. Yeah. Something gotcha. Like that. Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, it's 360. Uh, this is like a Japani, Japan inspired city, right? Like this is the, uh, the Japan rooftop. And this is Hong Kong inspired, but it's all the same system. It's based on the same building pipeline is based on the same city layout pipeline and so forth. Yeah. So the, so, so the uh, tools that yeah. you used to create Tokyo were the same yes. tools that you created Hong Kong with. Yes, correct. Yeah. It's, the, it's exactly the same tools. That's the thing. That's the strategy we need to think when we go procedural. Don't think about, uh, in fact, proceduralism is a little bit like investment. Let's say if you're talking about this project, there's the scale of World of Warcraft, right? You're talking about if it's a real time thing, it's about many levels, many worlds, and all that kind of thing. So when you build, like a, for instance, a pillar or a house asset, you're thinking about I'm not, I'm not uh, just doing setting up for one house. I'm, it could be hundreds, and, and it could be like fifty of this, like two hundred of that, and fifteen of this. So uh, yeah, as you can see, this is a, a, a application in two two worlds, totally different, and so forth. And uh, in Tokyo, there's no neon lights, but in, uh, in Hong Kong, there's lot, lots of it, yeah. Oh, wonderful. So, Fantastic. Yeah, so, yeah as, as you can see, we, we, we are trying out. And it's, it's, it's very complex. Uh, as you can see, it's very complex. There's lots of designs and so forth, yeah. The, the, in fact, uh, the, I always take advantage of uh, artists uh, to, to kind of let them express themselves, maximize their talent. So all these 2D art are done, done by a lot of animation students. So, so we all collaborate together. The idea is how do you correct, uh, take proceduralism, tech and art all put it together. It, yeah. it can be a few people, but it can go very far. Very good. Uh, these are uh, actually, uh, you know, ex like wonderful representations. Now I see a lot of organic uh, elements in there as well, especially in these uh, models of heaven and so forth, the statues and so forth. Did you create the statues uh, procedurally? Uh, no, the statue is uh, actually a ZBrush model and so forth. So this is the part that, uh, okay, the important thing, the important strategy about uh, proceduralism is this, you got to know when to go procedural and when not to. So pillars and towers are fantastic because you can dial in different resolution at different distance, but for uh, kind of organic modeling, uh, this will not be a good choice. Yeah, but you can modify things and, and, and merge things and like, for instance, optimize poly count when you come into Houdini and things like that. It's very good at that, but uh, certain things we have to leave it to the linear pipeline, the organic modeling pipeline. Gotcha. So, you know, yeah, these are, uh, yeah, this is uh, really fantastic. Now, um, oh, wow. Now, so you, you I Sorry. see you've got the, uh, 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 mountains and landscape and digital humans oh, yeah. as well. Would yes, you like yes, to express, yes. you know, uh, you'd like, like to talk about those as well? Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at uh, the mountain. 
So in fact, yeah, good question, because that will fire up another topic about proceduralism. This is not done by hand, okay? I'll go to the slides and all that. Oh, this is really a very exciting talk, yeah. Kind of able to show you so many samples. Yeah, give me a minute. Uh, we'll go to the part that I've uh, designed this uh, uh, thing, which is called One Kingdom. Ah, it's here. So uh, what it does is it, pro the, it processes landscape, mountain, trees, and rivers, and things like that. So fundamentally, the goal is, okay, this is created in Houdini 16, 16.5. Only during Houdini 17 time, Houdini came up with terrain tools. So I have to create mountains and all that way before the tech is available, I make my own. So what you're seeing here is you're actually looking at a terrain tool. My goal is I don't have an army of people to paint textures. I want to get away with creating terrain without painting the textures. So, and what I want to do is, I'll go back to the, I want it to start from just a few curves. So these are, these curves will generate the, the so-called the profile of the mountain. And once it's generated, the base, I've kind of created a, a number of attributes based on height, curvature, and I created procedural uh, uh, kind of a texture, kind of an uh, uh, information. So all these textures, all this uh, information, all this shading, I would say it's shading, can appear procedurally as you change the mountain. So it, it doesn't even need to do things like simulation and all that. And on the fly, you can create it. And like I'm cutting through a river and things like that. So you can just imagine uh, that we're talking about world creation. I need to create a huge world really, really fast with a very, very small team. So the thing is, this kind of tag will allow an artist to kind of like be artistic. So it doesn't tie your hand. In fact, uh, artist input is very crucial. It, uh, it, they will know how to make the right judgment of when to do what and things like that. So uh, yeah, this is uh, the first part. Ah, so if you want to look wow. at what is under the hood, uh, what, how do I spend my time? I spend my time creating all this network. But rest assured, if you just started with Houdini, you do not have to go to this extent. This after many years of experience, okay? So uh, yeah, this is one kingdom under the hood. Uh, yeah, so you're talking about this part of it is a lot of uh, uh, how you can input, uh, take in input like trees and all that kind of thing, and finally be able to synchronize the whole matter to become uh, 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 the output of the mountain and so forth. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is essentially uh, one kingdom. Let me see, do I have one particular? Uh, okay, I want to show you this one. Okay, this is interesting. Okay, this is, you saw the mountain creation. Uh, you see the green dots? Uh, this is the part where the trees appear. So not only I procedurally generate the mountain, it's able to be smart enough, there's a logic system underneath the hood to know you can sprinkle anything from trees to uh, buildings and so forth. It's entirely up to you. Uh, okay, I freeze here for a moment. I think this is a crucial, okay, it's freeze by itself. You see you have this uh, dome shape thing. So what happened is, right, once you, you kind of procedurally place the dome shape items, the trees and vegetation will, autom will procedurally automatically grow around it. You do not have to place the, you do not have to place the dome, place the trees and hopefully that the, the trees make sense uh, and hopefully uh, kind of coordinate with the dome. Uh, you, it's, it's done procedurally. You place the dome, the, the, place the dome, the tree will settle by itself. Yeah, so this is another part of a proceduralism I want to uh, explain. This is the part where we talk about procedural layout. So laying out by hand, uh, because I, I've done linear kind of production before, you know, just myself trying to play some items. It's a nightmare to do big scenes. So the idea is to take advantage of proceduralism, not only to generate the geometry and so forth, this is a case where procedural layout comes in. Yeah. So this is something that I want to share. It's very, very powerful. Let's say you're not going to pipe your data into uh, uh, kind of a standard engine, you want to use a uh, touch designer and so forth. Uh, so you're relying on what uh, uh, your, the asset Houdini can give you and you can uh, create all these dots and synchronize it and so forth, whichever format it is, or you can send a certain uh, data over and, and kind of see how it turns out in the end. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, beautiful. Now, is this a tool that you think a concept uh, designer or a concept artist could employ in order to rapidly create worlds uh, if they are doing it for uh, pre-visualization purpose or concept artist per uh, concept art purposes? Oh yes, definitely. Because the 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 whole idea is a uh, rapid prototyping that kind of concept. Uh, in fact, um, the in most of my asset, right? For instance, I'll show you later the city system. It actually have this low rest proxy kind of mode, so you can actually uh, be able to block out things very very fast. Yeah. In fact, you can explore some ideas just just like for instance, this is like a artist having some fun and all that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. It will it will help more than the layout artist or the the modeling artist is trying to create a mountain it will help even uh, uh people that want to do concept and so forth because like like this tool is creating cur curve generating a mountain is very similar to the the motif tool like how do you turn 2d into 3d concept artists are very good at 2d stuff so you are giving the concept artists things like curves and all that yeah they, they, they definitely can handle that so once they can handle that then just just block out your mountain in fact all these are if you look at it it's like a floor plan for your production yeah so this is, is really good for, for prototyping concept ideas very very good yeah now excellent now i i also noticed that you uh, have uh digital humans and uh organic beings in here that uh, aren't buildings and they're not mountains so would yes, you discuss right. a little bit how you created the organic living uh things well, especially oh. because we said that Houdini, Houdini or proceduralism was really good for the mountains and for the yes. uh, and for the buildings, but you also have uh, organic uh, characters as well. Yeah. Okay. Let me just uh, go to this slide, which I think it will help to explain. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have something semi-organic here. All right. This is interesting. All right. So this is a uh, this is a fusion. I have a base model that is a uh, organic modeling, right? You can do it in whatever package, Maya, Blender, whatever it is. But once, you know, in heaven, there's, there should be more than one shape of birds and all that kind of thing. So you're looking at a process whereby, let me see, let me see which part. Ah, okay. You can see that it's dialing in things like uh, the, the, the shape of the wing. It's changing the shape of the wing right? It's moving forward and backward. That's procedural modeling on top of an organic character. So things like this can be done. You see the, uh, the tail of the bird getting bigger and smaller. And this is procedural animation. This is done by uh, Chops channel operators, which uh, Chris love it a lot. So this is procedural animation all by uh, mathematical uh, oscillations, phase and all that kind of thing. So uh, you're, you're actually combining uh, you're actually dealing with organic stuff, but proceduralism on top of it. Uh, that's very, very powerful. So procedural modeling on the left, procedural animation on the right. You can see uh, some of the selection, uh, small, big, crown, big, and all this can be saved as presets. If you, you don't want to dial in everything uh, at, uh, every time, so you can kind of uh, store some uh, presets or options. These are not presets, these are actually certain options. Uh, I'll show you later my building generator. Actually, I do have presets. A lot of complex settings can be all stored. So you can initialize with a, a very good uh, base. Yeah, things like that. Yeah. Well, this is a, a brilliant demonstration of how you take an existing organic model and then you put it uh, through a procedural system and then you're actually uh, leveraging uh, the artist's talent in order to create variations and uh, different combinations in order to create um, hundreds, if not thousands of variations of one basic model and it could be reused uh, virtually an unlimited amount of time. That's, this is a fantastic demonstration. This is a, this, I'm really, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm totally overwhelmed. <laughs> I want to go and try this stuff myself. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. We can uh, we can discuss. I'll share. I'll share you the strategy and all that. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of people uh, uh, limit proceduralism, but at, at, for me, I strongly believe it. Also because of practical uh, scenarios. Yeah. I see. I see. Now, uh, do you have anything um, to demonstrate uh, the uh, the humans that you are using? Uh, oh, I okay. noticed that uh, yeah, uh, you also uh, had some uh, humans. Okay, let me see. I, I hope I, I have them in this file. Uh, uh, all right. Okay, humans. 
Yeah, because I let me see. Oh, it's not in this set. Okay, yeah, I do. Okay, yeah, good, good, good. Ah, uh, this is interesting. Okay, um, this right. Okay, you you talk about okay humans, uh, particularly angel, right? Mm -hmm. So the let's say angel. Uh, there's there's uh, anyway in any production, there's a lot of characters, right? So the idea is I created this thing called the one week pipeline. So what what it does is this. Normally, in traditionally, you have to model you have to animate you have to render or in other words you have to export but there's always a rigging and this and a very tedious process called skinning or you have to paint weights right but if you change the model let's say it's a it's a the creature at three horns then suddenly it has you the director say no i need four horns then you have to reskin we rig and all that is a nightmare right so we all know that so i created a one rig partner what it does the rigging will disappear the skinning will disappear as well so you can model as you animate go back and forth so this is a demonstration of how it's done okay so i have again it's similar to the the bird that you saw just now i have a standard character so what i did is down here if you if you kind of dial in and out you can you can actually uh, do things like uh, shaping the model and so forth you can in fact after i shape the model using some of these parameters immediately i can test the rig so I don't have to go and rig again and all that simply because he got longer arms. No, if you extend the, the length of the arms, it will definitely uh, uh, adapt accordingly. So this system also supports in change in hairstyles. And, uh, like this one, the, this, if you look at the screen right, a man become a lady. I'm adjusting the arms. I'm remodeling her and I, I'm procedurally... There's the rig adapts, man. Yeah, if you're looking at changing of hairstyles and so forth you're, you're looking at your uh, now i'm changing the hairstyle to tuck in a bit and all that so some things are uh, more subtle so you're talking about uh, uh pipelines like this that uh, this guy has just changed his hairstyle right so you're talking about pipelines like this that kind of uh the idea is to neutralize tedious repetitive tasks i think chris knows and we all know how long it takes to do a character read it should not be you know, repeatedly over a small team. So these are implementations that, uh, that neutralizes two very tedious process. As you can see this example, which I really like, which is a, 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 a male animation can be transmigrated to a female. Uh, this is another thing. You're looking at, uh, uh, oh yeah, I do have, a, oh, by the way, the facial rig is already there. So you can animate on the fly. You know, it's like a, you don't need to uh, rig the face again. And it supports uh, various kinds of faces as well, not only one shape. So you're looking at some deformation. And this is a, oh, by the way, in heaven, lo lo lots of angels, right? The, the ring uh, rig will, there's another ring uh, pipeline that it coordinates, able to coordinate uh, these two assets together. The character pipeline and the wing pipeline is coordinated. So uh, yeah, this is an interesting part of character. So you're talking about uh, the the this uh, you you can have you can have facial automation. You can have modeling automation. This uh, screen, uh, the black screen here, you get to see. Yeah, I'm actually modeling. So when I'm modeling, I'm actually rigging, with, and I can animate ahead in time. The same uh, the 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 artist that load the animation the asset can animate straight away while you do some uh, adjustment on the baseline, it will all uh, be preserved. So the idea is, uh, this is the under, under the hood, this is what it takes. <laughs> this is a yeah, pretty <laughs> intense job. So the, the idea of proceduralism, it do not limit yourself. Uh, Strategy-wise, do not miss, oh, this is, yeah, someone going to do the organic model, but why? Just leave it to that shape and size. Maybe longer arms. Maybe it can become an ogre or monster or some sort because it has longer arms and all that. You don't want to re-read it again. So yeah, this is a classic example of uh, character, the application of character. And uh, let me go to the next slide. Ah, yeah, so this is a good example. Uh, uh, in, in my tag, what I did was I was able to create uh, the foot automatically adapt to the ground. In fact, this finger thing is not animated by hand. If I move the one finger, the rest of the finger will follow through, just like a traditional animation. Things like that can be animated. So you're looking at, oh, procedural modeling, the facial rig come for free. You're looking at 
IK, FK, you're looking at adaptation, you're looking at the wing that goes along. So even if you, you're, in a, you're in a hurry, if you animated a male walk cycle, uh, just, just plug it into a female model and refine from there. You just have to start from scratch. Yeah, so things like that. Yeah, so this is uh, interesting. Oh, so also like like that, you, yeah. you've created one biped character uh, abstractly, yes. and then you modeled uh, your, uh, then you model your character depending on the, what you have, but really yes. all that you've had was just, uh, you created just one character and the result yes. is literally an unlimited or an indefinite number of objects uh, or a uh, number of characters built by yes, the correct. system. Correct. Yes. This is the whole idea of proceduralism. So uh, this, this thing, I've never really seen it before uh, in terms of, uh, something that I can do all the way to the wing. Yeah, so uh, it's, uh, it's something that I came, I, it came to my mind that uh, how do I resolve this? So I pipeline the whole thing, yeah. So uh, yeah, so this is the, the whole idea. In fact, uh, we, I, I, in my studio, we actually uh, asked the artist to create another uh, shape of the head, just the head alone, and we pipe in the system as it's able to adapt as well, according to certain rules and so forth. So uh, it, we are constantly working with the artists that generate models and so forth. We don't stand alone. Procedural teams should not stand alone because you, you have to leverage uh, and collaborate and, and let each uh, other's uh, talent combine together for the, uh, for the final output. Yeah. yeah, I see. This is really inspirational. I want to, uh, I want to go and uh, grab a hold of your uh, scene networks <laughs> and then just uh, reverse engineer them. I think this is, this is uh, uh, really, uh, really amazing stuff. Now, yeah, do you have anything? Is, do you have anything more here, at least as far as your character work? I see you have this. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, this is the wing system. So again, wings is even uh, more tedious than uh, than uh, just a character biped rig because it has many many uh, items. So the idea is, if you look at the purple uh, purple controls, you just drag drag it. It will model. It will model the 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 wing, but you do not have to rig. You can, it's already ready for rigging. You can distribute the feathers using the RAM and all that, like what I mentioned previously. And yeah, after the whole process, ready to animate. So you do not have to uh, worry, about, worry about it at all. So uh, these are some of the processes that helps. Let me load the next video. Uh, give me a minute. Okay. Oh yeah, right, let me load this one. Yeah, this is the next part. Yeah, so this is the low res. We all, all want to animate fast. So this is a low res proxy. So when you do proceduralism, always, Take care of low res proxy for especially animators. They like low, uh, uh, kind of a quick feedback. So build it into your system. That's one way you can learn uh, Houdini. Houdini, you can actually adapt very easily from low res to high res and proxies and things like that. So uh, you can you can style everything from uh, the, the feathers and all that. Yeah. So in fact, I I, I am a person that loves to watch movies and so forth. And uh, after I watch a movie that has uh, wings and all that, I come back and implement it to my system. Yeah. So my system is always evolving. Yeah. This is a the, the, the wing and so forth. Yeah, so it, it, uh, for instance, a pipeline like this, you can, we call it, I call it dynamic modeling and rigging because it's on the fly. You're modeling, you're rigging at the same time and so forth. So uh, there's uh, some solutions to solve feather interpenetration, varying uh, feather resolutions, uh, customize, customizable feather distribution and styling, uh, animation feathering rig, uh, advanced uh, wing deformation. Now I see that uh, this is an awesome uh, list of uh, features in which you were demonstrating that. Did you was it require? Did you have to come up with this feature set before you started to create your uh, networks, or did you uh, create these features on the fly? Uh, it's something like on the fly. Uh, normally, what I do is right. The most important thing, personally, about proceduralism is you start the base right. Um, you, you, you don't start with a very complex base. When you build a base uh, for, for, for seasoned TDs like myself and Chris, we, we can actually manipulate anything from a dot to a line or a curve to its maximum effect. But when we adjust that base thing, everything will drive itself. So my, I, I actually added features as I go along. I don't have the full feature list. As I'm doing, I actually, I'm actually watching some making of and all that. How to do, how do they uh, avoid the, how do you do uh, 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 feather interpenetration issues? How do you solve things like that? How do you, uh, then I notice, oh, actually when I watch the movie, the, the feathers uh, will curl when it's uh, facing the wind and all that kind of stuff. So I added in the system. But if your base is too complex or too cumbersome, it will not be able to drive and pass the data down. 
It's always done on the fly. Oh, fantastic. Now I see that you, you have the organic characters as well, but uh, also I noticed uh, on a couple of your slides, you were dealing with some hard surface uh, models as well, uh, yes, such, such as, uh, uh, such as uh, automobiles and yes, other correct. things. Correct. Uh, yes. So uh, how, how would you uh, go about using uh, proceduralism in order to uh, integrate them with your hard surface modeling? Oh, okay. So let me uh, go to the other section. There's another very good question. Uh, let me go to, oh, by the way, uh, before I jump to oh, yeah. the earth part of the thing, I will, uh, I will finalize the heaven part of uh, the, 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 the thing. So the, 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 this is a tower uh, uh, generation. You see these pillars? Uh, this hard surface modeling. I have a layout and modeling system like the tower. So it's able to give you settings that you don't have to pull a vertice to do something so complex. So this is the part about hard surfacing. I am integrating beautiful motifs that the artist draw into something that I can create towers on the fly. So actually the, the, the interesting story is, uh, this is how we integrate. For instance, hard surface modeling. Uh, like this, as said, uh, I kind of like, I didn't have a whole list uh, when I started, for instance, uh, one day I was watching uh, World of Warcraft, the movie. You see, if you see this, uh, this uh, curved staircase, it wasn't in my, in, uh, my system initially. I, was, I, I, I bring the team to watch uh, the World of Warcraft movie and I saw this beautiful spiral staircase and I came back a few days later, it's in, in the asset. Yeah, so uh, it's really fun. <laughs> uh, proceduralism is like when you get into it, uh, it, it totally does not tie your hand, but uh, it, it, it kind of take your imagination very far and allows you to uh, express yourself. So this is, a, this is the, like we're talking about uh, proxies, even in real time, we do have a lot of collision object and all that. So if you use Houdini, you can actually easily create uh, this kind of like a proxy for dynamic collision and so forth. For myself that time, it was actually for visual effects. Uh, for instance, you, you want the, the particles to avoid it. So uh, this, all this can be generated if it's done correctly. So you're talking about hard surface modeling, one asset, you come out with this amount of combination of towers. And uh, we remember that the pillar is also procedural. So whenever you add in more pillars, you merge it a bit, it becomes another tower. The combination is endless. So uh, yeah, so that, that is something I want to talk about. Okay, before I Please. move on, uh, this is an important slide. So this is the 2D part, okay? You collaborate with 2D artists, you input your 2D art into a pillar asset, you input it in the motif, and finally, the tower system, the tower pipeline will be the assembly of all these uh, micro assets and it's also a modeling and the layout tool together. So if you do it correctly, think in terms of this kind of strategy. Yeah. So pillar to the artist work, finally you combine it into heaven. Yeah. So uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the first uh, shot that we have tested the he one heaven pipeline all collaborated into one. Yeah, so uh, it, it works the same for real time. It's just uh, real time you have to uh, kind of watch your body count and things like that. Yeah, so I, I guess in the future, uh, there's, uh, it's, it's uh, much easier. As you can see, all the new game engine uh, release, they can support uh, kind of a geometry in a more efficient manner. Okay, so let's go to the part that we talk about the city, right? The, one, uh, the hard surface parts. Okay, all right, that's cool. Okay, so we, are, we, are, we saw still just now that you can take a look at, uh, it's, it's complex, there's loads of stuff uh, in, involved. So uh, the idea is, uh, it, it need, as you can see, there's a, cities, uh, apart from the human beings, are mostly hard surface, right? You, you see a bus, you see a bus stops, and, and you see, you can, the, the thing about my city, I, I didn't want to uh, have a very dead place, so I actually have uh, items inside. So from inside to outside, there's tons of proceduralism. Okay, so let's look at, okay, this is the Japan. So as you can see, the, the city uh, pipeline that I built is not a one-off thing. I can use it at multiple angles. This is a street angle. Just now the bus stop is a little bit high angle. Then you're looking at an angel, angel plunging down. You can imagine the, the magnitude of uh, uh, consideration we have when we created this, right? And then, uh, oh yeah, okay, here comes the, what is, uh, what drives the whole thing? So this is a, the building generator of our 160 system. So this is a, a system whereby you can, the idea is you build a very strong base. So things that you can change 
Uh, you can add exterior detail, you can uh, control the roof. You can merge a little details like what you can see just now. And this part, you can see that it's quickly blocking out the overall shape. This is uh, laying out roof details and all that. So these are uh, billboards and so forth and, and things like that. Uh, this, this system is, is uh, well, okay, when, when we're in production, we all know the kind of nightmare. If we manually uh, model the, the building, for instance, let's say if the director say, oh, I love this building. It's uh, 23 story now, but uh, my character is flying through at the, 20, at the height of 25. Everything is nice, but your building gets in the way. Can I have 25th floor? And you know that you perhaps have to burn your weekend and do some sleep to do it. But with this system, no, just increase it to 20, 25 floor. In fact, uh, at, uh, at this uh, Seagraph Asia 2013, I show a demonstration of this system can go out to 1,000 floors. It's never needed, but it can be done. Optimize your system, that's I say. So this is uh, the procedural modeling. So you can see that once the, it's based on something like a floor plan, once you have the floor area uh, decided, everything will adapt. So it's like you're looking at uh, all kinds of details that, that, that will apply in every conceivable angle. Okay, so okay, this is interesting. This is what I call a day in life of a procedural artist. Once your tag is done, you pass it to an artist or you do it yourself. Like for instance, what is happening here is, oh, okay, I am uh, having a, uh, a building. Okay, like I want to adjust the windows here a little bit and uh, oh, okay, I, I want to adjust this part of it and so forth. Do you realize there's actually interior details there? There's the interior will be procedurally populated. So you do not have to worry if the shot entails uh, looking in or maybe uh, you want the character to kind of uh, crash in the window or some sort. So you're looking at, oh, I'm not only doing one building, I'm actually blocking out the whole area. Hey, what if I change the floor plan or, or, or adjust the area a bit? The, the building actually adapts. It's actually laying out and procedurally modeling at the same time. Like, for instance, I want this camera angle. Okay, I want a, a, a more sense of depth. So I want this skyscraper just at the back. So you're talking about, you're able to block out shots, imagine your, your scenes and all that in, 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 in kind of a pace that's never happened before. So after that, like I added detail here, once the height is done. So for instance, like this area is, is, is kind of like, a, uh, you're, you're merging the width of the building and so forth, the depth of the building, but the interior is already procedurally populated. So you're talking about, oh, uh, in procedurism, we also deal with shaders. For instance, when you press render, uh, for this uh, particular scene, the, the, the lights in the, in the ceiling are not of the same intensity. The, the, the kind of brown tile you see is not the same, it's randomized. Uh, and you see interior detail, and you get to see that uh, the, some windows are open, some windows are closed. So procedurism can give you a lot of noise, a lot of uh, live-in kind of feel, uh, 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 just, just kind of, just give me the parameter. Everything will be figured out for you. For instance, oh, you know, uh, city. This thing is always uh, lifted and dirty. Uh, this procedural noise. You press render. The the noise will be created for you. So we talk about modeling. Now we talk about city layout. So this is layout by another part of the one city pipeline. I call it the the. It's a city layout system. So this is a procedural dirt pass when you model when you render. All the dirt will be procedurally uh, generated. It can apply for real time as well uh, if you configure it correctly. So what you saw just now is applied to this shot. So the, the next thing is, oh, okay, how about another angle? Again, I do not have to paint the dirt by hand. Okay, so when you're dealing with large scene, this topic, this question is about World of Warcraft scale. So you do not have the resources to paint every corner of the building and things like that. So uh, these are the things that proceduralism can help you in the long run in all sorts of production, as, especially big ones. Yeah, especially um, if you have a, a dream of doing big uh, uh, games, uh, scenario visualization. Yeah, go procedural. That is what I always encourage. It will, it will get you there and it will save you a lot of frustration because you can make changes. So yeah, this is uh, yeah, this is another one. As you can see, it's sustained from multiple camera angle. Now, is there anything else that you wanted to show, at least as far as uh, this uh, demonstration on proceduralism is concerned? Okay, I yeah, this I is don't the, know if, the, if you have anything else that you wanted to, to, to demonstrate oh, here. Uh, uh, this is a, perhaps one of the final part. You're talking about uh, the city layout. So this is 
uh, a good example of when I style, I change the rows and uh, columns of the road, all these lamp poses, all these all these uh, road marks were procedurally generated. You do not have to place them by hand. It's also very tedious. So you are talking about I'm laying out, but the buildings were automatically added, although they manually put it. So this is a whole coordinated city layout system. Yeah. So uh, this is you see it uh, in uh, in OpenGL. I can block multiple cameras simply because procedurally created. Yeah. I also have a procedural camera rig and all that. Yeah, let's not get into that. It's, <laughs> it's very far-fetched. I, I proceduralize whatever I can. Yeah, I have a camera rig and all that. So you can see it hold up in a multiple camera angles. Yeah, so uh, yeah, just, yeah, okay. This is uh, yeah, fundamentally some of the, the, the things, yeah. Well, Douglas, this is uh, absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, as always, um, Whenever I see your material, I just sit there and my my jaw just goes open. Uh, I can't oh, believe Chris. the amount of uh, creation that uh, you're able to produce by on such a micro sized uh, team. So this is a uh, an amazing demonstration of uh, what is potential uh, with proceduralism and so forth. Um, now, uh, before we uh, get going, uh, do you have any other additional words that you'd like to say about, uh, you know, how the students should go about learning how to do all this or uh, any particular uh, mentality that they should uh, adopt before uh, learning these tools? I think uh, some of the uh, mentality I would say is, uh, for instance, uh, let's say you talk about the the when you talk about procedural strategies right so don't stop at if you have built a system once uh, a workflow once that you have used it in production and you realize that hey, perhaps it doesn't because the base uh, workflow is very uh, rigid it ties my hand in the end so it's my primary decision so do not uh, worry about creating a brand new one because your past experience, your procedural knowledge will build up and you can try a totally different approach. It's entirely fine. For instance, uh, just a, uh, one final uh, example. For instance, you saw that I, have, I do have a, a building uh, tech and so forth, right? Uh, in the, in the uh, earlier on. So actually, I wanted something different this time. You know, I wanted uh, something that kind of able to uh, store a lot of style so that the user can move very fast. So I actually uh, created one from scratch. I have a new floor plan, I have a new mas uh, master plan of the strategy, and I did another one. So the whole idea is uh, do not tie yourself down because certain, certain uh, strategy can only be taken so far. So if uh, feel free to go further and Really create another one because you're more experienced. So this is another city layout system that I did uh, based on my previous knowledge. I want to try, if I put a central area, can I have lower buildings that populate by the side? So this is another area. So the whole thing is uh, your first system might not, your first procedure asset might not be your best. So don't worry and uh, do attend uh, uh, talks, uh, tutorials, I, I like also at, uh, attend things like what Chris is sharing and all that, so that you can kind of have more options. A procedural artist can go very fast simply because, right, we know many strategies, not just one. Don't ever stick to one. If not, you will always, uh, always be uh, uh, kind of, you can't grow, you know. Even if you are always doing buildings and city, try different strategies. You'll be surprised what you can come up with. So I think that will be a advice that I would uh, I would say, you know, for 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 learning proceduralism. Yes. Oh, excellent, Douglas. Like as I said before, this is absolutely uh, phenomenal. I'm uh, totally blown away by uh, by your uh, level of quality, uh, your uh, commitment, and uh, your artistic integrity, and so forth. And I think that this is a, is a, a, a totally amazing demonstration. I'm a, a bit, uh, I'm a little bit taken for words and so forth. <laughs> Uh, so thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, but before uh, we let you get going, um, is can you uh, provide the audience uh, with um, uh, techniques or uh, how to get in contact with you or uh, where they should get? Do you have a website or do you have a location of where uh, if students wanted to learn or or 
professionals wanted to go and learn more about these techniques uh, from you, is there any way that they can get in contact with you? Oh, okay. I think it's, it's, it's good actually because of uh, now, you know, the whole world, we are, we are kind of like affected by the, the, the situation. So actually what my, I came up with something new. Okay, give me a second. Okay, so uh, I think it's, what Chris is doing is fantastic. It has inspired me to, to kind of like uh, have, what I want to do is because I guess the most accessible will be LinkedIn. So if you, if you go to LinkedIn, you can type in uh, Douglas Leong. Uh, uh, my own uh, business is Radiant 60, my training and consultancy business. Uh, or you can type Douglas Leong Houdini. There's only one guy that does that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you can't remember Radiant 60, Douglas Leong Houdini. So in my LinkedIn, uh, I, 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 I started to post. This is a post that I want, I want to share uh, some of the professionals that I meet and all that in, in all my years of Seagraph Asia sharing and all that. Then this is also a, a, a place where I want to uh, kind of like uh, share some techniques, some strategies or things that I've talked about today so that uh, more people can, can benefit and, and go uh, further and all that kind of things and, and uh, whatever training information or, 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 or strategies and all that uh, to, to take further. I think uh, follow my LinkedIn page it will be the most efficient for everybody. Well, excellent. Thank you very much, Douglas. This is uh, absolutely uh, fantastic and totally inspired. I want to just go in and play with Houdini all day long and create my own, uh, my, create my own worlds from it. I'm just uh, chomping at the bit going, oh, this is so awesome. This is so amazing. I can't believe what's going on here. This is really great. Um, now, before I let you go, do you have any other passing words that you could pass on to any, uh, any, people who's just starting off or to experienced professionals? Okay, uh, one final thing. I just wanted to tell you that uh, some path, it takes effort and patience and uh, perseverance. Okay, the, the, when I kind of like scope went procedural, my first, the biggest barrel was not um, the, 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 the notes and all that. It was my attachment to what I'm comfortable with. So those early days, I, I'm a, a lightweight user, you know, and I, I kind of do some uh, modeling, everything there. So it's a, 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 a good package, but it's a linear workflow. It's not procedural in, in, in any way. Uh, it's very little in that. But Houdini is a totally another paradigm. So we're talking about paradigm shift. So the thing that I want to encourage everybody to go procedural is this. You stay with it. If you want to build a house, if you need to spend more time, you know, learn more in the evenings or whichever you put extra time in, stick. If you if you are going to go, go procedure with Houdini, stick with the package and finish your house. Then you will have the confidence to build your net asset. If you keep going back, uh, if you find it difficult, tedious, or you cannot create the quality you want, you will not progress very far. So in fact, uh, it might sound dangerous. I would say. You have, uh, you have learned a lot of shortcuts and all that, maybe for box modeling. The thing I would say is forget what you have learned, go procedural, play with the notes, assemble the logic, maximize your effort there. Yeah, that is something that is huge. That will take you a long way. <laughs> those are outstanding words of wisdom, Doug. Uh, thank you very much. I think that, that's a, uh, that those are excellent uh, rules uh, to live by, not just for proceduralism, but for uh, your journey as an artist, as a visual effects artist, uh, any kind of artist, I think that those are, uh, uh, that's an excellent strategy. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me on your channel. It's such an honor to be able to speak alongside with you. I've, uh, I, I'm, I'm really delighted and I'm so happy to see what you're doing for the community as well. All right. Well, very good. Uh, well, thank you very much, Douglas. And uh, as always, I look forward to working with you in the near future. And I, uh, I am totally jazzed and I'm totally excited. And I will be getting in contact with you in the very near future for some yes. other projects uh, that uh, I have in mind. Because uh, this, uh, uh, this definitely corresponds to what I'm trying to do uh, as myself, as an artist myself. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Wonderful. OK, thank you. Uh, have a good day. Okay, have a good day. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. All right. Let me see if I can get my microphone working here. Almost there. Oh, let's change this over. Oh,
hopefully uh, this actually works pretty good. Uh, yeah, I, I, I seem to be getting information, so this is great. So thank you very much for joining me to today's special presentation of Douglas Leong's uh, uh, interview. We will be, I will be reposting this interview on YouTube. Uh, please uh, wait till this afternoon uh, and I'll get it up and post it again. There's a lot of really good information here and I encourage you to relook at this video, relook at what Doug has done and maybe you can get some idea or some inspiration of what you would like to try to do and develop your own procedural systems. All right. Thank you very much for coming to Tech Art Talk Live today, and thank you very much for your patience. And make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, and make sure you sign up for the Facebook and LinkedIn groups under my name, or go to Tech Art EDU in both Facebook and in LinkedIn, and you'll see organizational pages there that you can sign up for. Thank you very much, and I'll see you again next week for Tech Art Talk Live. Have a great week.